Welcome back to the channel. We've had so many questions about the channel in the past, I thought it would be nice to do a Q&A video. How exciting. <laughs> so we get the questions both from people in the industry and from the public in general. And if you'd like the short answers, those are no, no, yes, no, yes. And other than that, what's been going on here atop ART's Global Command Center. Of course, you know, we had a total solar eclipse back in 2017, but this year we've got the partial eclipse, which was pretty exciting too. Here it is in the viewfinder, and this is the maximum of what we got in our area on this partial eclipse. Another thing that uh, we've had in the area surrounding us, not so bad right in our area, but my son Richie sent me this picture of a cicada, and he also sent me a video of the sound of the cicadas not far from his house. So one of the most popular questions we've received has to do with products. Can we get a list of the products you're using? And what about putting affiliate links in your description box? Well, of course, that's a very good question. Uh, unfortunately, the products that I use are industrial products which do not have uh, affiliate links associated with them. And the other thing is that our purpose of our channel is to support the industry. We're not a DIY channel. Now, I'm not opposed to DIY channels. In fact, uh, thanks to them, I'm able to keep up with automotive diagnostics and automotive repairs, and so I do all my own automotive repairs. But there are already in existence a lot of DIY channels, and this is not intended to be that. The purpose of this channel is, support, is to support the industry overall. So if you're a member of the public, consider this channel a classroom where you are able to just walk in without paying any admission. So feel free to sit down and listen and learn, um, but no affiliate links. It's to be assumed that all the people in the industry already have a supplier and already have someone that they can call concerning products. So for the technicians that call about products in specific, uh, there's a reason that we don't feature the products for them either. What we talk about on this channel has to do with the principles of repairing, the science, the principles, and the methods. So we dignify the technician by allowing them to take what they learn about the science and the principles and apply that and decide for themselves what products they have available to them that fit the description there. So by doing that, we don't enter into the long litany of debates. And believe you me, in the past, when you get a bunch of technicians together, there can be a lot of debates about products. Oh, uh, I don't use that. That doesn't work. Or about suppliers. Uh, I can't work with them. Uh, they got my order wrong last time. I'm not going to deal with them anymore. I don't like him. Uh, <laughs> this endless debates. We're not going to get into any negativity here. So if you have a preference for a product, fine, right? Uh, a lot of times, though, I ask somebody why they use a product, and they say, well, I don't know. Well, somebody told us to use that product. Well, <laughs> that's fine, but that doesn't describe the principle behind using the product. And sometimes you get this. I just use that product because I'm comfortable with using it. Uh, okay, well, that's, that's a good reason. Or I buy from so-and-so because we get along together and he knows what I need, and that's fine. So... Each person can decide what products they use and where they get those products from. Let's uh, avoid all of the negativity, all the debates. So we keep our 
discussion going in a positive direction in this channel. So that's the only way we're going to do it. Uh, just to illustrate this, I met a prospective trainee at a trade show, and he thought about getting some training from me, and that's fine. So I saw him again at the next trade show, and I said, did you end up getting training? And he said yes. He got some guy closer that taught him a few things. Uh, and, and I asked, how is it going? Well, I'm having problem with adhesion on my color coat. Okay, what are you prepping with? Well, he said to buy this stuff from Kmart or whatever. Okay, well, here's the answer. <laughs> Go to Kmart. Tell them you're having trouble with adhesion on your products. <laughs> right? And my suggestion, talk to the person with the, with the Kool-Aid colored hair because they would most likely have a scientific background. Right? Maybe they could help you. There's another example, too. Uh, so uh, there's a call that the, the distributors get quite often, and it's, uh, it's from somebody in the industry, and it might go something like this. Hello? Yeah, this is Bob. Hey, that leather product you sent me, it don't work. It don't stick at all. I see. Okay. So uh, let me pull you up here and see what we've got. Okay, yes, uh, I see you here. So you've bought... Uh, $20 worth of products from us over the past year. I see. So, what are you prepping with? Well, I get that stuff at the Dollar Mart. It's pretty good. Oh, okay. All right. Well, we suggest something much different than that. We have some items to, uh, to help you with that. We have this gallon of, of cleaner, and we have this gallon of uh, prep, and uh, we have some scuff pads... So uh, how about if we put those together in an order for you? No, I don't need that. Your stuff ain't sticking. Ah, okay. Well, have fun. Bye. See ya. Wouldn't want to be ya. <laughs> so the idea of this channel is, is to mature to, to the idea that we can support the industry when you have to call someone for help, why not support the person that you're expecting the help from? And uh, w another thing that I've done over the years that's helpful, if I find there's a product that I want to use, I will let my supplier know about it and then he can carry it for everybody. And then when I need it, I'll just get it from him. Make one phone call, get everything together, and uh, that really makes it easier. So purpose of this channel is just to help support the public, help to support the technicians individually. We don't step on their toes, and we support all the distributors everywhere. So we're trying to mature the industry into an adult way of thinking. And uh, by the way, someone told me after one of my last videos that the most adult thing that's happening on this channel is that I am spending my money to support distributors that don't support me. <laughs> but it's okay. That's what the channel is for. So this channel will always be a unique channel, right? If I don't have affiliate links, if I'm not selling you uh, products, if I'm not sponsored by somebody taking other people's money, okay, that's okay. This channel is going to be different. It will always be different. If you're going to watch this channel, you come here because it's something unique. It's something different. So don't ask me to be the same if you're looking for something different. I learned many years ago that pursuing a goal means that you're going to be different. And you may have to go at that goal alone even. And the experience is from sixth grade science class. We had a science fair in the sixth grade. And what I did, I got some pond water from the farm and I had two containers. One had mostly paramecium and the other had amoebas in it. So for the science fair, I had two microscopes and I had the ability to 
put a drop of water of each under each microscope, and I thought to myself, the parents of all of these students probably have never, ever witnessed for themselves a live paramecium and live amoebas. They could see them here. This is going to be a smash hit. It's an interactive display for the show. But uh, I didn't win first place, much to my chagrin. <laughs> and uh, the one that won first place, uh, she painted pictures of dinosaurs. Okay, so I thought, how, how, how does that win first place? Well, I had a teacher explain to me that she won first place because her parents were popular about town. And that was eye-opening for me. Now I thought I was the real winner, okay? Not because I was popular, but because I pursued my goal despite it not being popular, right? So I've always thought, pursue your goal no matter what anybody else says. For example, if you had a vision, how many people are going to see your vision? Right? Nobody's going to see your vision. If you were to explain your vision to some other people, how many are going to be on board with it? Very few. Might be like the Wright brothers out there working in their shop and... Uh, into the night, and the mother says, uh, you boys, you need to get in here. Your dinner's all cold. Why are you messing around with that junk out there? You're never going to amount to nothing. Why don't you get a real job? <laughs> Not seeing their vision. <laughs> and some decades later, we're flying in the air in these buses with wings. <laughs> so... Sometimes uh, pursuing your goals or your visions by yourself, being independent can even be seen as being rebellious, uh, sometimes as a youngster. And nobody appreciates it until your vision comes true, right? It comes to fruition, and then they finally see it, and then they benefit from it, and then they're happy. It's like the, it's like the, uh, the skater, right, for the Olympics, uh, She's doing her skating routine, and everybody loves her. She wins the gold medal. Everybody around the world is in love with her. It's so wonderful. They have tears running down their face. But uh, while she was practicing, she didn't have many friends because she was always working toward her goal, getting up early in the morning and practicing, her and her coach working hard and suffering through, you know, not uh, availing themselves of all of the comforts and luxuries everybody else is having to pursue their goal, and no one else understands until she wins the gold medal. So this is uh, what we're doing with the channel. We're striking out as different and not afraid to be different. We're pursuing a certain goal, and how about if we stick to that goal, right, to see it through to fruition? That's it. Now, please don't think that I'm just some kind of totally independent spirit or anything like that. Um, although I have to admit that when I go to Outback, I park out front. One of the questions that we get is, can I bring my car to you? Can I get you to fix my furniture? Well, thank you very much for the vote of confidence there. But you notice also on this channel, I am never soliciting any service nor selling any products whatsoever. So I'm still working a little bit, right, semi-retired, still providing great service, but to fewer customers at this time. I'm not asking for anyone else's money in order to present this channel. So, And uh, this channel is not for my profit. It's not for my benefit. See, I feel like if I'm eating, then the next thing I would like to do is make sure my brother is eating. And I have an expression, everybody's my brother, except my sister, of course. And think about it, each year we get to write what's the next chapter in our lives. So for me, this is the next chapter. And for any cause, there needs 
to be historically someone who's going to step forward and advance the cause. He might even be like a sacrificial lamb on a benefit uh, of the cause overall. So speaking of which, uh, it is a great sacrifice that I do the channel. This channel is, in fact, a full-time job by itself. I can spend a whole day organizing these video clips. Okay, I spend twice the time doing a repair because I'm doing the videos too and setting that up. It's a lot of work. It's, it's not just content creation like most YouTubers are doing. I'm not assembling common events, news items, and so forth. So I'm actually working with innovations, right, from the industry, creating and, and, and inventing things that I'm using to create the content with. And so I'm preparing a lesson plan along the way. I'm building a brand new curriculum along the way. So how much is that worth as full-time work? It's worth at least $150,000 a year. And I'm five and a half years into it now nearly. So you can do the math. But the thing is, it is with great personal sacrifice that I'm doing this work. Don't get me wrong. I'm glad to do it. That's what I do, okay? So when other people come in and ask uh, also about uh, products, uh, getting you to buy product from somewhere else, or people chiming in on the channel wanting to sell their services, no, I'm not even doing that for me. So we're not interested in doing that for you. We're just here to support the industry, helping to support everybody equally throughout the industry and the public. That's it. But you might be wondering, how can we keep it going? And I wonder, too, maybe we can't keep it going for much longer. But how do we do it? We have a video. So if you're wondering how it is that we're able to finance the YouTube videos with our service business, that's a very good question. In fact, the question that I had for Aranita is how are you able to balance the books when I spend more than we make? Well, I caught her in the shop one day and I found out her secret. And I'm going to reveal that secret today. And I'm gonna show you how she does it. Actually, I'm gonna let her do it. But here's how she does it. She takes what we make for the week, all right? And she puts that in the vise. She angles it down like this, all right? Let's put this, I'm gonna to have to put this handle up here where she can get a, a grip on it. And we're gonna leave this angle down and we have a little tin to catch what she squeezes out of the money. That's right. And we're going to have her come over here and show you how she does it. Okay, now Eternita is going to grab the handle and put a squeeze on this money. All right, go ahead. Squeeze it. Oh, wow. Now, just in case we come up extra short for the week, we put uh, extra leverage. I put a wrench on the end of this bar right here so she can get extra leverage on that and squeeze that a little bit more this time. Oh, yeah. Oh, look at that. So how do we get by on the YouTube channel? Here it is right here. Another question that I get commonly on the channel is, can you help me with a particular repair situation? Yes, I can. Glad to do that too. And this applies to technicians as well as the public. If you have a question about a particular repair, send me a picture and then we can discuss it. We can make a plan of attack. And remember, it'll be a suggestion only. So I can suggest something based on a picture, 
But when a repair tech comes to your house, he may see, see things completely differently. This is very typical. We see something very different in person, okay? And even a technician that comes in person may see that plan A is not working and he needs to move to plan B. So we have to allow for that variation when we give a recommendation. And I'll never admit to falling back to plan C, of course. <laughs> so I'm glad to help when I have time. I have some few examples here uh, to show you uh, how I can do that. So in this picture, there's some damage, of course, on the top of this chair. What can be done? Well, I can make some curved lines. I do this in, in, in uh, Inkscape, which is very much like Corel Draw, or I think it's called just Corel now, which is a vector program. So I'm showing here where I might suggest doing a double needle blind stitch and insert some new material. Uh, did this work on this chair? I have no idea because uh, I didn't hear back from the people and that's often what happens, don't hear back. Here's another example. Uh, what would you do with this? Well, I would repair the top of the armrest. Well, the person doesn't want to repair the top of the armrest. What would I do secondarily? Well, I don't know. Um, can you sew some material together, like on these red dotted lines? Can we trim and tuck it around the sides? I don't know. Nonetheless, uh, here you go. This is all one piece door, by the way. It's not a separate uh, armrest. On this particular old model, I think this is an old model GM, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, does this repair even work? I don't know. I haven't heard back from the people. It's just uh, they want me to do a plan B on this and uh, throwing it out there. Glad to help if I can. Here's one where the dog took out the corner of the chair. Yes, uh, you could try double needle blind stitch all the way around with a new piece of leather. Did that work? I don't know. I haven't heard back either be nice to hear back because then we'd know maybe next time what we could recommend, right, for the next customer. Can you recommend a repair tech in my area? That's a great question, too. I would love to be able to recommend a repair technician, but uh, unfortunately in our industry, uh, that's not really going to be possible. What you see on this channel is ART's repairs. It's my business's repairs for my customers. That's it. It's not uh, for the industry overall, okay? But uh, one thing that we have done uh, in this channel is that we have been a research and development arm for the industry overall. I have some pictures here to show you uh, what we're doing. Here's a video of yet another repair product. We showed one repair product in our previous video. Here's another one with a very similar outcome. You might uh, enjoy this one. Okay, so flex it a little bit. We want to make sure it's flexible. Okay, good. Now I want you to grab it equally and try to pull it apart. Pull it, pull it, keep pulling it, pull it, keep pulling it, pull it. Can't. You can't get it apart? I can't do it. Keep no. going. You should try to keep going. Try to keep going. Right. Keep going. I can't. <laughs> I can't do it. Okay, this is this you, is you need to So try. this has been dried for six hours, okay? okay? So you try. Okay. Okay, you try. I'll try it. You're gonna have to make sure I'm still in okay. in frame here with the right, camera. Right. Am I okay. in frame now? Up a little bit. Up a little bit. There right. you go. Okay. okay. Okay, I'm gonna try to pull it apart, ready? Okay. Okay. Holy <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I can't believe it. 
There's no way. Let's push that this way. Uh, this is... No, no, come on. This is... Ah! I can't. I couldn't do it. Some of you may not be aware that uh, children that were raised up in the 60s a lot of time had a chemistry set. That was very popular back in the day. We didn't have cell phones, you know. <laughs> so entertainment was a chemistry set. I finally ended up with one of those trifold chemistry sets that even had a microscope in it too for some biology. It was the creme de la creme of all the sets. So we still do that. We still have a designated area in our shop for doing these experiments and that helps the industry along. Wow! It took Samson to get it <laughs> I can't believe it. Okay. Wow, that's amazing. Here happens to be some urethane with a urethane repair. We haven't finished uh, the development on this yet but that's part of what we do here. This is a little test on some leather. Doesn't mean too much to you, but we're working on another project here. That project uh, came a little further with this particular test. We put a hole through the leather, reinforced it a little bit on the back, and then uh, we did a little bit of repairing on the front. The idea for this is this scenario. Let's say that you have a couch with a seat cushion, a seat bottom cushion that has a hole right in the middle, but the cushion is not removable from the couch. How are you going to fix that hole? So I've been working on a new method for repairing where we can emboss the grain right into the repair material right in the middle of the couch cushion. I'm using an oxen grain here simply because that is the deepest grain I have. So I'm illustrating the depth of grain that's possible. And uh, just for your information, sometimes even with customer repairs, if I want to keep track of the repair area, I will put the oxen grain in it, even if it's not called for in the piece. Don't tell anybody about that, but I can show you in the future, in some future videos, where I do certain things to certain repairs just to help keep an eye on them or to show uh, the public um, what's possible in the videos. So just for your information. This is purely experimental here. So we're making brand new leather in the middle of a leather cushion that's not removable. Another thing I'm working on is a complete uh, adjustment to the way we do vinyl repairs. It's something I've been doing for a good while. And uh, how am I going to illustrate that to other technicians instead of just doing a repair in the field? It might be wise to do a comparative test on some samples where I've actually cut the vinyl and filled in with two different kinds of repair methods. That's still in the works too, and that'll come down uh, in the near future. Something else that you know, we've already uh, highlighted uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, was a new cloth repair method that we showcased at the Mars seminar. Because these things have been, what we don't like about it, these can be goals. This is not related to our industry, but I thought you might uh, enjoy seeing how we question everything in our industry and it applies to other things that we do too. Question the, the current procedure and see if we can improve on that just a little bit. In this picture, you see a couple of roller screeds for concrete. Getting ready, we're getting set up here to place the concrete the next morning. You can see one end of the far roller screed rides on the curb. Now that curb is placed at a specific elevation. The other end of the roller screed rides on a pipe 
and you can see this pipe is lifted up to a very specific elevation and this is measured specifically so that you'll have a slope and you'll have the water running off in direction of wherever the storm drains are. So this is a very critical adjustment. It has to be checked, double checked, triple checked before you pour the concrete. Now what holds that pipe up? Well, what holds the pipe up, we'll show you a little closer view here, are these chairs that sit in the ground and then there is a screw attached to it with a yoke that holds the pipe. In this instance, the base is called Crush and Run, and it's roller compacted, and it's super hard. And it's difficult to get these chairs pounded into that Crush and Run base. So, I saw two people struggling to get one of these in, and I thought, uh, what can be done to improve? They're using a small hammer to hammer each of the legs of the chair in. And in this picture, you can see the chair here on the left with the four legs. So I thought what we needed is something to hit all four legs equally. And that's what this device is over here on the right. I had a welder make this device out of some really heavy duty pipe that'll slip over the top of the chair We've got uh, a flange around the pipe on the bottom to equally distribute the weight on all four legs of the chair. And then we've got a plate on top to hit with a 10 pound hammer. Let's give it the beans, right? And once that's inserted into the crush and run, then you can put this yoke down there and you can adjust it. You see the threads there, it can be adjusted for height to get the exact elevation we need for that particular area. And so the end result of this was that one person could put in 12 chairs by himself in the time that it was taking those two people to put one chair in. And after 12 chairs, you're ready to hand that hammer to somebody else and let them do the next 12. <laughs> okay, so that's how I think in anything I'm doing, asking questions, can we improve on it a little better? And so this made setup days so much easier. Here we were the next morning, we're ready to roll, figuratively and literally. At 5.30 in the morning, we start in. It's still dark, we've got a lot done already. We're gonna be done by 10 o'clock. We've got two crews here, we've got two Roller screeds going on. Not that it's a competition or anything, but we won, just for your information. So this is what ART tries to do, is try to be out front, answering questions, analyzing the way we're currently repairing and trying to improve on that. And if I'm able to improve on that, then as years go by, I'm going to question my own improvement and see if we can improve on that. So we offer those same suggestions to other repair technicians. If they want to try those out in their work, that's fine. If they don't, they don't like what they're seeing, don't do it. In fact, I've had them tell me before, no, we don't want to do that, and that's fine. So I don't have a list of technicians either if you want uh, recommendations for technicians, but it wouldn't help really um, even if I did have a list. And you might wonder why that is so. Well, here's two reasons uh, that that is so. Many technicians do not cater to the retail customer. And the second reason is, from my perspective, we have an industry in crisis. So let's talk a little bit about the first thing, about the technicians. So technicians oftentimes in our industry cater to the wholesale customer. They will be working at the dealership level, at the back of uh, the dealership for the used car side, getting their cars ready for the front line. Okay, So that's their business plan. That's how they're going to make their money. One car after another all day long is what they hope to have. And so they have an invoice full of cars by the end of the day. That's their bread and butter. That's their business plan. And they should stick to it if they're going to be successful at that plan. 
Also, as a result of that, many of these technicians are not interested in doing retail quality work. They want the quick work, the really fast, expedient work, get it in and out, right? They're not concerned about the retail quality work. I've had techs tell me, I've heard it from numerous sources, we don't want to do what Rick is doing because we just work for the dealerships, okay? And if they're doing day after day work on the wholesale level, then they're not really ready to jump up to the retail level. What do we mean by retail quality repairs? A retail quality repairs is one where the final inspection is the end consumer, right? At the, at the consumer's house, working on their car in their driveway, or they're bringing their car to you from their house, it, in, it involves people that come into the service driveway of a dealership. They know where their damage is. They want the service department to make it right, and they want it to look like brand new. The retail customer is the one that's going to examine your repair with a magnifying glass right up close. You have to pass muster with some of the most critical people on the planet to do retail quality repairs. So many, so if you're, if you're inquiring of a technician now that's doing wholesale work at the dealership, they may not be ready to step up and do quality, retail quality repair, that is. And if they say, no, I just work for the dealership, then run. You shouldn't expect them to deviate off of their business plan for the wholesale work, okay? They're not going to perform like you want them to, you're not going to be happy anyway, so don't push the issue there. Also, many people want to work at the dealership level because they don't have to deal with the public. And as you know, dealing with the public can be stressful, and many people feel like it's just too much trouble to, to deal with the public. The public is not informed or knowledgeable as far as what to expect from a repair, they might be too critical when it comes to what to expect from a repair process. As you know, we can't guarantee 100% on repairs. We would like it to be functional. We approach 100%, but we likely, as I tell my customers, likely going to be a couple percentage points short, right? But still something that you can work with. Here's an example of what we're talking about with retail quality repairs. This customer came back in with this problem of this discoloration on the leather. Now the backstory is this. The upholstery shop had replaced this bolster that you see that's dirty, but it didn't match the rest of the leather. So they had me coat this leather the right color. Well, the customer's coming in after a month and they're complaining that the leather has lines in it. And now they're complaining that uh, it's got this staining in it too. It's both this seat and the passenger seat. So this is dirt on the seat primarily and what looked to me to be a little bit of blue jean dye transfer or denim dye transfer. So I mentioned to the retail customer here that uh, this seat just needs to be cleaned and it uh, has some blue jean dye transfer. She said she didn't wear blue jeans. I said, well, maybe, uh, you know, denim skirt or something. No, she doesn't. Well, maybe somebody that drove your, no, I'm the only one that drives the car. I said, well, the reason I mentioned that is because uh, people know uh, that dye transfers easily from these things. So you can't wash blue jeans, for example, in the same load as you're washing white t-shirts, because then you end up with blue t-shirts. And she said, no, you won't. <laughs> so I immediately, I immediately turned and walked away before I said something, because what I was going to say in reply to her would probably make a sailor blush, and I didn't want to be guilty of that. So this is why people hesitate to work often for the retail public. They can really be ignorant. In this case, this woman lived in a culture where every sentence was a lie and everything that went wrong is somebody else's fault. You can't win with somebody like that. 
So I just walked away from it, and uh, I was done. Well, it just so happened that the poster called me in uh, a few weeks later, and this car was there, and he said, just do whatever you can. Okay? So all I did, I sprayed some cleaner on my scuff pad and cleaned both seats, and it took me 30 seconds, and we were done. Why was I able to do that? It's because when I did the job initially, it was a retail quality repair. I cleaned the new leather and prepped the new leather appropriately. I put the color on with Crosslinker. There's a clear coat on that protects the color coat. The clear coat has Crosslinker and a slip additive in it as well. So this leather cleaned up just like the day that I dyed it. No problem. 30 seconds. We're done. That's retail quality repair. But this is why a lot of technicians don't like to deal with the retail public. The second reason that it's difficult for me to recommend technicians is because we have an industry in crisis. So just because somebody claims to be in the business, that's not enough. There is no standard that they have to measure up to in order to be in the business. There is no standard uh, way of repairing anything. There's no certification that they have to measure up to. And so it's like the Wild West out there. To recommend somebody just because they're in the business, this is what you could run into. Here's a seat that had lacquer color on it. And is quite typical when we see this, the lacquer is all cracked and peeled away in certain areas and it's revealing the true color of the original leather underneath. There's been no prep work done. So both the seat and the steering have the wrong colors. Likely an aerosol can was picked to do these and that aerosol can had whatever the closest color in their inventory and that's what they used. That's pretty sad. And they used the same color on the door panel as well. So you might wonder, what was on the door panel that they had to color over? Well, let's check. Let's clean off the color and see what's there. Oh, nothing. It's fine. If it's dirty, though, paint it. Also, to strip these seats of all of this lacquer color, you do realize that uh, the solvent is $30 a gallon, so we use an expensive product to have to strip away somebody else's product these days. And by the way, the younger generation is taking these shortcuts and doing all of this stuff, and the old guy has to come by and clean it up, and I'm pretty much tired by the time I clean up their stuff. That's better. This particular job comes from the detail shop. Of course, they don't clean and prep either, although the industry is trying to cater to the detailing aspect of the business. You've got to educate detailers way more than just hand them a product and say, touch it up with this. Here's another example of a super glue repair and again, lacquer color. They're too lazy to prep. They're too ignorant to think they can get adhesion without prepping. So we have bundled services, laziness and ignorance for one high introductory price and a little spray on the seat belt to boot. We can use a little solvent to test for rattle canitis. And there we are. And you can see here that they have used super glue in what is supposed to be the most flexible part of the seat where it has to double over. And then they just spew some color, whatever color, on top of that. So we could have a song lyric for that. It's glue and spew. Too bad for you? It's not like new. It's glue and spew. Here we have some white paint oversprayed on the plastic and on the seat belt, which is 
pretty typical, the seat belt buckle here, that is. A little bit on the console, sometimes that happens. And, would you know it, a little super glue, as if that's going to close up the vinyl and get the super glue all hardened down there on the plastic, too. That's okay. Rick will take care of it. Rick will clean off the wrong color off the steering wheel, too, and we'll refinish that properly. Don't worry. I've got to tell you this experience. Some guy came into the area from out west, and he claimed to be everything uh, that needed to be to refurbish aircraft interiors. So a guy came to me later, and he said, uh, "This, we've got a problem because this guy, when we put the seats back in the plane, all the colors peeling off the seats. And I said, well, what did he prep the seats with? He said, uh, well, he asked him that, and he said, lacquer thinner. I said, you didn't question him? He said, yeah, I, I wondered uh, if that was right. <laughs> and he's using a solvent paint, which is commonly used in our industry by a lot of people from times past as well. And uh, it's all coming off. What a disgrace to the industry. So when you do that in our industry, people lose faith. They think that our industry is not up to the task. We had another example of that here. This is a seat from a retail customer where all the seats were coated with the color you see in the lower right-hand corner. It's sort of a lighter bluish color. All the seats were the same color, but they're all the wrong color, and the coating is totally off now, almost totally off. So he brought this to the upholstery shop and wanted new leather. But the upholsterer told him, the leather is fine. It just needs to be recoated. The retail customer says, that leather coating doesn't work. How would you answer the customer if he said, that doesn't work, that recoloring the leather? Bear in mind, he is looking at the evidence. How would you answer? How about this? Sir, you are exactly right. It doesn't work. And would you like to know specifically why this didn't work? Yes. Okay. Look at the color. Is the color right? No, it's way off. Okay, so the technician didn't take time to make the color properly, right? Okay. The color came off rather easily too, didn't it? Yes. That's evidence. Now, even though we used water-based color in this instance, which is commendable, they didn't use cross-linker, so they only did half the job. And therefore, it wasn't impervious to the, salt, to the cleaning preparation that was done on this seat that ended up taking most of the color off, right? Yeah. And no clear coat on there to protect the color coat as well. True? true. Okay. So he's not taking the time or going to the expense to use proper products. True? Yeah. Okay. Good. Let's look at the seat bottom. And what's the condition of the leather here? It's filthy. Yes, sir. So all this leather has dirt on it. Do you think that the leather coating would attach to the leather and stick to the leather if there's dirt in between? No. It hasn't reached the, <laughs> the coating hasn't reached the leather yet. He's painted the dirt, right? So is that going to stay? No, of course that's not going to stay. Too lazy again. Bundled services. You get lazy and ignorance and cheap and don't care, all bundled together for one high introductory price. Todd Snyder wrote a song, Easy Money, and in the chorus was this lyric. It's sad, but it's true. Everybody wants the most they can possibly get for the least they can possibly do. Do you see that here? <laughs> so then the question to our customer is, if we rectified each of these particular situations that you witnessed, don't you think we could be successful then at doing a proper job on your seats? 
and he was convinced that we could, and so we did. So we do have an industry in crisis. We can't change the whole industry, right? We can only invite people to change for themselves. So if I cannot recommend a technician to you, what can you do as a member of the public? Well, when you're requesting work of a technician, then the first recommendation is, starting off, don't trust anyone, Dr. Jones, right, to use a movie quote. So you have to be selective in your technician. You want to talk to them. If they show you before and after pictures, how about that? Well, what does an after picture not tell you? <laughs> Based on the previous pictures that we've seen. The after picture does not tell you whether they've cleaned and prepped properly, does it? It doesn't tell you whether they've used water-based products similar to what's on modern leather, right? It doesn't tell you whether it's cross-linked, if it's got a clear coat to protect it. It doesn't tell you any of those things. It doesn't tell you if there's super glue inside that repair, does it? The after picture doesn't tell you any of the critical elements of the repair that you need to know before you get a technician to do your work. It tells you nothing. They might say that they have a lot of experience, uh, but even that doesn't mean anything if they've been doing the same old wholesale quality work year after year after year. So it's important to ask specific questions, and you can ask those questions based on the repair principles that you see on this channel so that you're better informed. And you will be listening to the technician answer you and seeing if he truly does know what he's talking about or if he's just, you know, blowing smoke and trying to make himself appear to be everything that he is not. So now we turn our attention to the repair technician. So now the consumer is asking you if you can do some work for them. What can you do as a technician? So you can answer intelligently, right? You want to bring something positive to the table here. You want to add some discernment and some input and share that with your customer because, number one, you want to build that trust. It's up to you to build the trust in your reply. Let me give you just an example of how that might work and how it did work in my case. So the customer sent me a picture, and this is not a very good picture, but uh, I thank them for sending it. It looks like it was powered with a potato, doesn't it? There is a scratch that goes uh, into these two panels and it goes, looks like it goes through the stitching too. They sent me a second picture. This is a little bit better. Uh, so what can I tell the customer in preparing to uh, do this job for them? Well, the first thing I noticed is that the scratch didn't appear to be cut all the way through. That's good. It'll be a more structurally sound repair. Okay. Now, we have a sharp cut, and that'll tend to continue to pull apart if we just put a little filler in there. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to sand out this scratch and make it wider so it's graduated, right? It won't be a sharp cut. It'll be graduated or dished out from side to side. That will hold the filler better because there'll be a wider surface there for the filler to attach to the leather, and the leather will be sanded so that the filler will attach better as well. So with proper prep, I think we can get a filler in there, a nice flexible filler that'll do the job. That sounds pretty good. Also, what about the color? I see a little bit of shimmer in this seat here, and so I'm thinking, uh, is this a white pearl color? I know the, the lighting is not too good. The customer says uh, she thought it was called linen or something similar to that. Okay. So they use marketing names in order to sell products. So linen would be a good marketing name. Yes. 
Uh, but just in case, now I don't usually carry white pearl with me uh, on the van. That's a specialty product that I do have in the shop. So I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll bring it along with me in case that is a component of your color, that white pearl. And what I'll do also, I'll mix a color ahead of time that's close so when I get there, we won't have so much time spent mixing a color. Maybe we have something that's close to what we need. Sounds good, doesn't it? Yeah. So we build confidence with the consumer. We give them some direction. They see that what we're going to do makes sense to them. It's reassuring. It builds confidence. It builds trust. And the job went as expected. And there is some white pearl in this seat. Good thing I brought it. The next question I get is, are you still doing training? This will be our final question. And uh, at the time of separating these questions out, we were not doing training. Uh, the epidemic put an end to the one-on-one -on -one training. And so the answer was no, but as you could tell from some videos we've posted, the answer is now, yes, uh, we are back doing some training now. So what does that involve? Can we talk about the training more specifically? Okay. So I am more selective when it comes to who I train. I want to train people that are sincerely wanting to be craftsmen. Okay. So I'm not here to motivate somebody. You have to be self-motivated. That's what that means. What I do if it's training at my location I like to prepare a month in advance. I have some materials. You've seen them in a video. Try to prepare the materials ahead of time so that we can do some work in-house, right, in the shop. If I need something in addition to what I already have, I'm going to go to a salvage yard. And oftentimes, I spend a couple hundred dollars there. I know people don't like to do this. I don't mind spending the money if it's going to get the training done. Let's get what we need. Let's get the proper training done. So go to the salvage yard. I have time there to get what we need, look for what we need. And so then the training could go smoothly. The other thing I like to do is line up work ahead of time at the dealerships. Of course, the dealerships don't want to let work hang till next week. They want it done now. <laughs> but I do what I can to save work back. Okay. And uh, I'll show you an example of that. We had uh, some seats to fix in a baseball stadium, and uh, it needed to be done pretty quickly. So I called the prospective trainee, and I said, we've got some seats that it looks like we have to sew up mostly, and there might be some vinyl repairs uh, otherwise to do in those seats. In the baseball stadium, it's kind of unusual for us. Are you interested? He said, yes, I am. I said, okay, we're going to schedule that then. I think we scheduled it for the first day of his training because the first game was on Friday. It's raining, so it's a good thing we had the chairs to fix that we had to fix. Of course, we're not fixing these down here, the cheap plastic ones. We're up in the expensive seats where we have protection from the rain. And... Uh, our trainee is way down there working by himself while I'm out here looking for a hot dog and a beer. Yeah, right. This is typical of some of the repairs. I don't know if this is the exact same seat uh, that he worked on, but something similar to this is what he had to do, his very first double needle blind stitch. Pretty good old boy on that one. We had some other vinyl repairs which weren't uh, that attractive. Uh, we were a little bit limited what we could do with this very soft vinyl where it was pulled apart. This is a marine vinyl. Kind of tough to work with sometimes uh, when it's splitting out at the seams. There's limited what you can do uh, heat-wise there. But it only has to last one season. For the same trainee, I had saved this particular metallic uh, panel for him and uh, the color that I had 
get ordered in specifically was a bronze color, which was a custom color, really. I asked if they had bronze, and they said, yes, they could mix a bronze and send it. So I said, okay, send. I didn't know what it was going to be exactly. And you can't see the true nature of the color unless you look up there where the sun is shining on it, <laughs> incidentally, from this photograph. So I had never mixed that bronze metallic before ever, and of course, neither had he mixed any of the metallics, so I asked him to mix that color for me, and he did in about 30 seconds. It was mostly the bronze color and some of, I think, uh, the number two uh, titanium, if I'm not mistaken, and he had it. He had the color dead on. This was his first job spraying. He said he was a little bit tentative about spraying this kind of job. I said, okay, I'll do the first half if you do the second half. And there we go. So this is typical of trying to save some work back for the trainee when I know it's going to be especially helpful. So the question uh, then arises, what about uh, training at your location? What do we need to take into consideration? Well, again, we need about a month to prepare, right? We want to get the best rates on flights, got a rental car, and uh, we want to prepare as, as, as much in advance. We have a hotel room. Prepare as much in advance as possible to make sure that we get that trip locked in there. And it's also incumbent at your location to prepare, start preparing a month in advance, whether it is that you get parts in from the salvage yard or whether it's the fact that you're going to have plenty of work anyway at your location. It's very important. We're going to talk about that in a little bit more in detail. But uh, the training that we are doing is different than training that's ever been done in the past. So in the past, we've had like a list of products that we've trained based on the products. So I'm not doing that anymore. I don't care who has what products. We have to change the focus of our training to meet the modern needs of the technician. And we talked about that in that video that we did from Phoenix, right? We have to change the way to become a modern technician. So one of the people that were offering training, one of the outfits has a, a training manual that is a new training manual, but it's written like it was written in the 1980s. It's a disgrace to the industry. They're a high-priced uh, outfit where you can get some training, uh, but you might as well just take the manual and do that. That is all the good that it is. Sorry. We're progressing in the business, folks. Your distributor your source of training does not understand the modern technician. Sorry to have to break that news to you. There's another outfit that has an item list here of 102 line items. All right. So I just crossed out 51 of them. We don't need them. That's too much. And... The idea, uh, I, can, I can understand the idea from their point of view that they want to give the beginning person a uh, variety of products so that they can choose from, have samples of each of the products. That's too many products. As you know, we narrow down our product list uh, depending on the repairs to be done, right? So that's, no, I'll throw that away. <laughs> That's the new way, right? Let's whittle down the product list a little bit. Remember, we spoke about targeted training. We have a list of all of the items that are likely to be repaired in any modern vehicle on any dealer's lot, which means that we have targeted products for each of those targeted items. So we're going to simplify the training and have fewer products. Now, if you used, say, one repair compound, that's fine. You can choose from six, seven, eight 
repair compounds. But why do that? Why confuse the person that's just getting started? Why not do this repair with this compound? And let them know there are lots of other compounds in the future. When you get going, you can get samples of each of those other compounds which have different properties for different applications. And then you can, you can handle it then. It's too much to handle right now. Let's focus. Let's do the work, 99% of your work. With 99% of the products you're going to need to do that, let's keep our focus and not get too complicated here, just getting started. You'll be better off for that. Now, if we do training at your location, as we mentioned, we, we have something, I'm going to read to you some things that you need to do at your location. You have to take some responsibility here. Just like I prepare a month in advance at my location, you now have to do the same thing at your location or we're not going to make it. I'll show you an example of that. As far as access to dealership cars, all persons involved should be aware that we need access to all cars intended for the auction so that we can use them for training purposes. Hey, what a great idea. The damages will be repaired in class as a free upgrade before going to auction. Who's going to complain about that? Bring it on. Yeah, we want all of it that we can get. The first cars to be loaded out should be scheduled first as well. Yeah, we can arrange our schedule to do that. Also, any cars from the detail department needing repairs should be available as a priority. Right? These are going to the front line of the dealership. They need priority. We can actually repair cars and bill for them during the training. It pays for the training. Isn't that sweet? But we need everyone involved in these cars to understand what we're doing so we don't run into roadblocks along the way. Prepare in advance. Again, trainees should correspond it's communication, folks. Trainees should correspond in advance so that we have all available materials in place in order to make the best use of your time on my arrival. That's critical, isn't it? These include a mixing station toolbox, drop cloths for car interiors. How are we going to work on a car if we can't uh, put a drop cloth over the instrument cluster when we're doing the steering wheel and so forth, right? We could have some get some cardboard tab to use to help on masking. We need a compressor, hose, and gun setup that works. You can make sure that works ahead of time. Where do I mention that? Empty containers for storing mixed colors. <clears throat> so there are things that might come in a repair kit that's not enough to actually start working. You need to prepare so that we're ready to work when we arrive, again, to make the best use of your time when I arrive. That's so important. Now, not only have I upgraded our approach to training overall to, to break into the modern repair world, but we've also, in addition to that, focused also on coaching this is something that comes along as a result of years of training many people in the business. Not everybody is the same. So it's nice to train for the products and the method, but it's another thing entirely to coach the individual. For example, you might have someone that's had experience in the body shop and uh, they may have used a paint gun, but somebody might have had experience only maybe um, delivering pizzas. Nothing wrong with delivering pizzas, but they've not had a practical hands-on experience with a paint gun, let's say. So we have this list for modern repair technician personalized coaching with Rick Lockwood. What is the goal? To be more comfortable, to be more productive, and the most important thing, I think, to be more confident, right? That's important when you're going out. You need a coach. Everybody needs a coach. I need a coach. I need 
fellow technicians to coach me. Okay, um, Tiger Woods needs a coach. Everybody needs a coach. Here's an example. In uh, Japanese painting, uh, it's called sumie painting. There are different brushes and different ways to make brush strokes. But there is one style that you'll probably never get unless you have a coach. And that style involves the way that you hold your brush. It involves how you hold your arm and how you keep your hand. And what your coach is going to do, he's going to set a glass of water on top of your hand. And you have to do all of the brush strokes without dropping the glass of water. Okay? That's why you need the coach. You'll never figure it out on your own. So, <clears throat> Just to give you an example about coaching, even a person with a body shop, uh, with body shop experience, he may have a way of coating an entire panel. Set the gun at the right setting, uh, as far as flow is concerned, at the right PSI for the pressure, and at the full trigger, right? So you got consistency throughout, and that's fine, and that's perfect, okay? But what we do is not that. What we do in our industry is artistic. We're going to use the gun more in an artistic way than in an overall panel like you would do uh, most likely, you know, in a body shop setting. So I have four different ways that we regulate our gun for the artistic expressions. And each of those four ways are different combinations of these. The fan, the distance away, the PSI, how much you pull the trigger, and whether the gun is stationary or in a sweeping motion. Four different combinations of all of those. That's personalized coaching. Another aspect of the personalized coaching has to do with color matching. We're going to divide color matching into color theory and what we call eye training. Eye training is very personal. Color theory, you can read out of a book. When it comes to seeing the color, what's necessary? Let's illustrate it this way. The computer is designed to mimic the person, right? The computer has a processor. That's to do the work of the brain. The computer has an input device. That would be similar to our eye. What do you need in order for the input device to communicate to the processor? Software. Are you born with software? <laughs> no, you have a processor and you have an input device, but you have to write the software. That's eye training. You're going to probe your input device for certain outcomes, and you're going to weigh those responses with the brain. When you write codes of, of uh, li lines of code in software, you can do such things as if and statements. If this is true, then this, or if and and then. You know, there are certain qualifications based on what the input device sees, and then you make a certain response or check something else, and you come to a conclusion in your software. So the eye training does involve the same probing questions. And so that's what this whole process is about in personalized coaching. It's all put in place. It's all analyzed here in a way that we have the one-on-one -on -one help that we're looking for in the training. The personalized coaching for you, right? And you're not the same as the next guy or the last guy. We want to tailor this instruction for you. If we had to spend more time on one aspect of this than on another for you, that's what we do. This list is for me to make sure that I don't accidentally overlook something that's going to benefit you. Because sometimes I'll just go on with something just so naturally for me because I've done it so long, and I overlook the fact that you've not done that. And it doesn't come naturally to you. That's the purpose of this list, to remind me to be as helpful to you 
as I possibly can. That's what a teacher should be looking for. Again, the goal of this is so that you can be more comfortable with your training, more productive with your training, and more confident in what you do. I had a recent uh, experience in Chicago where we didn't have any communication ahead of time. I didn't even know what I was going there to teach. There was no preparation on the part of the business. There was nothing there to work on. And I got there a day early because I knew the business was broken and maybe I could help. And I went there with the right attitude of trying to help. Uh, but there was nothing there to help with. Nobody had got anything ready. And since I got there a day early, they wanted me to start early. But on what? There was nothing there to work on. Uh, none of the products were organized. None were opened. So we wasted a lot of time. Still, we tried to make the best of it, but we won't do this again. That's why we're going to be very sure that we have good communication in order to get the job done properly. I did manage to make the best of the trip. This is the Peter and Paul and Mary Church where it was blowing in the wind. <laughs> Got up close uh, to talk to a couple of the geese. This is the Chicago airport. Stayed nearby. Woke up the next morning to a little bit of snow. That was nice. We hadn't had snow this year. And... Uh, Nice to see it. So I made the best of the trip. Of course, uh, eating out is always nice. The nice part about uh, going out is eating at new places. Like I say, when I'm out of town, it's time to go into the hunter-gatherer mode <laughs> and see what you can find. <laughs> this was pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty good, too. Looks good. Huh? So I'm going to leave you with some music this time. Let me explain what this is. This is a songwriter's demo. This is a song that my sister Mary wrote. She asked me to put down some parts to it, so we're trying to keep all the parts tasteful, but all, these are all simple parts. No, it's nothing complicated on my part here. I did have to put the vocals on there, so that's embarrassing for me because I'm not a singer. And usually on a songwriter demo, you want the vocals out front. Right. This is just something to put the song together, something to present to the real studio talent whenever the time comes. And if that time doesn't come, then it's a keepsake for Mary. So this is Mary's song about our grandpa. Seems short to me Though you were 83 Till now I never realized How much you meant to me But the years we had aren't gone They're safely locked away In the dearest places of my heart Where they will always I want to thank you for those times The few they might have been For being there when I needed you And for always being a friend For calloused hands so tender And a heart of pure gold With wisdom so far beyond what most men could ever hold And I know these words of mine Will never reach your ears It's not because you're gone from us It's just that you're not here No, you've not been forgotten In this world you've left behind 
Your gentle words still linger and echo in our minds. But there's one thing that we can still do. We'll remember you. On that porch one summer day What will you do when I'm gone? I didn't know what to say But now I know the answer Because it rings loud and clear Every day I wish you were here We'll remember you I know these words of mine will never reach your ears. It's not because you're gone from us, it's just that you're not here. You've not been forgotten in this world you've left behind. Your gentle words still linger echo in our minds but there's one thing that we can still do we'll remember you no you've not been forgotten in this world you've left behind go in our minds and there's one thing that we can still do we'll remember you oh there's one thing that we are sure remember you, man.